This week on Quadriga, Europe's new populism, financial crisis reloaded? Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte tendered his resignation to Queen Beatrix this week. His minority government is the latest casualty of the European financial crisis. The coalition collapsed after the country's far-right Freedom Party refused to support spending cuts. In France, President Nicolas Sarkozy is also on shaky ground, ahead of the May 6th runoff vote. He trailed socialist François Hollande in the first round of the elections. Both left and right have attacked the incumbent's support for fiscal discipline. Are Europe's voters saying no to austerity? Your host on today's show is Ali Aslan. Hello and welcome to Quadriga. Many European governments have already fallen to the financial debt crisis. And with more elections yet to come, there is no telling as to who else will get voted out of office. So today we will examine not only the economic ramifications, but also the political fallout of the crisis. And to do so, I am joined, as always, by three guests. Welcome to Una van der Waal who is the Berlin correspondent for Holland's biggest magazine, Elsevier. Quentin Peel is chief correspondent in Germany for the Financial Times. And Ulrike Gero, who is a senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Thank you all for being here. Une van der Waal, Holland's was in the headlines this week. The Flying Dutchman this week was played by Mark Rutte. Uh, the government has collapsed uh, due to austerity measures that were supposed to be put into place by this government. Give us a sense of the mood in the Netherlands uh, these days. Well, I think the mood is very split. I think if you talk to the people on the left, they're very happy that Geert Wilders, the guy who supported with his right, his populist party, this uh, liberal conservative government, they're happy he's out and they see it as a chance to a new government, to make a new government and um, uh, make an end to the austerity measures. On the right, uh, people are very unhappy and they call uh, Geert Wilders a traitor, a traitor. And they say uh, now the chances of uh, making sound economic measures are over. So it's a really split picture now. It's a split picture then in the Netherlands. Uh, Quentin Peel, the Netherlands failed to muster enough political vote. Uh, Mark Rutte, failed to muster the political backing, if you will, to meet the 3% criteria, uh, which we will talk in more detail to come. But um, if the Netherlands cannot muster enough political support, really, is there any hope for uh, any other countries out there in the EU? Yes, I mean, the Netherlands certainly is a country you'd expect to be pretty united, if you like, in uh, imposing a degree of fiscal discipline. Uh, having said that, the truth is, I think, still across the political spectrum, there is support for a degree of fiscal discipline. On the extremes, though, you do have a growing number of people who are voting to the right or to the left. I mean, if there are elections, I think, to due now in September in the Netherlands, you're going to see a rise in the far left as well as uh, the support for Geert Wilders. So that's, I think, the key to what's happening in Europe, that there is a shrinking of the middle ground and people are starting to vote more and more for not necessarily extreme parties, but different parties, minority parties. And it's really making politics much more difficult. And you have touched upon many important uh, issues and elements of this financial debt crisis, which we will go into more detail. But Ulrike Gero, just to focus on the Netherlands once more. Um, so it's 3% of the GDP. The budget deficit is not supposed to surpass 3% of the uh, GDP. Uh, that at least is what has been set forth by the fiscal pact. Uh, now, there's no support for that, at least not in the current coalition. Uh, within the within the Netherlands, do you think that this will set a bad example, if you will, for other countries to come? Well, I think we have been seeing years now where many countries had not a deficit ratio of 3%. So it, it, it's not a sort of a disaster. But of course, now we have the fiscal compact. And this is what is now the European policy, which is that we all reduce deficits down to this Maastricht rule. Let's be reminded it was the Maastricht rule in 92 who said 3% deficit and 6% um, and debt ratio. On the other hand, there are many economists out there who say this is an arbitrary figure. And uh, a 3%, uh, whether 3 or 3.2, doesn't make a big difference. But I 
agree. Uh, what is of concern is that if you want to reduce, and that was the issue for this, uh, um, um, the, the exit of Mr. Rutas, is you want to reduce 47 billion in a, in, a, in a budget and you need to do savings. And the savings, of course, touches retired people, uh, all spending on education and those who are on the, on the losing end of, of societies. And this is what creates populism. And this is what Quentin pointed to, which is that on the right, like on the left, we have parties which are increasingly radical, like in France, where it's Mélenchon and Le Pen coming up to something like 30 percent of populations. And there, I think there's a difference because you have 10 or 20 percent is different than 30 because 30 starts to be a plurality. And pluralities change society. So I think 30 is a big uh, sort of threshold where something impacts on the political system. And this is what we are seeing, by the way, in the Czech Republic, in the Netherlands, uh, in France. And you're saying that the 3% uh, budget deficit set forth by the fiscal pact is arbitrary. Um, those are your words. But, uh, and even that is not really working, Une van der Waal, is it? I mean, the European zone, the Eurozone is in a recession. And unemployment is at a record high. So the budget cuts, even the ones that are being implemented, are not really working, are they? Well, I think it's far too short to, uh, to, to, to say something like that. I mean, uh, it's a very long-term process. I think we will deal with, have to deal with this maybe five to ten years more uh, to see any results. What I basically think is that the political systems in Europe are uh, a little bit outdated, I could say. You see a lot of fragmentation in many uh, countries, also like the Netherlands now and in the Germany also. Um, but I think the, uh, the parties in the middle, so parties like soci socialists, Christian Democrats, liberals, they are not capable of reforming. They will never be because they will be punished by their voters. They will never change CDU, SPD or in, in, Ger or in the Netherlands. They will never change. So they actually invite other parties to, to come along and to, to rise because they are incapable of really reforming. And quite some, yes. Well, I was going to say that the problem for, I think, the parties of the middle is they'd all got squeezed into rather similar recipes. Mm -hmm. So they've all been in favour of a degree of austerity, uh, but they're trying to combine that with reviving growth. It's possible that we're going to see actually a very good political debate coming up again now, thanks partly to what's happening in France with François Hollande really forcing the issue of growth. We've got to get growth back and not just have austerity. And I think that the voters of Europe have tended mm -hmm. to say austerity alone is not enough. Now, if that debate could come in, and that could be a good left-right debate, mm -hmm. it might revive the middle ground of politics. Um, if they don't actually get a real... show that there are real alternatives to vote for, then I think people will continue to peel away and go and support Hert Wilders or the pirates in Germany or Marine Le Pen in France, and that's the worry. Yes. Yeah, and the problem I is only uh, how... Are you going to make that growth? How, how are you going to make, you're going to make it possible? Because by tax uh, saving uh, uh, people more and putting more state money into the economy, I don't think it will happen. Because where is the money going? It's going, going into social welfare. It's going to their, to their own electorate, right? So it's not going into the economy. I think the uh, role of the, of the government in the economy is overrated anyhow. So, and in France, it's, France sets a very big exa a bad example, I, I guess, when, when Mr. Hollande is going to win tech, more taxation, more uh, put state money, bigger role of the state. It's exactly what Europe doesn't need. I, I don't. Uh, let's go first back to what Quentin said. I think it's really important because um, it's a little bit this calling Crouch argument. You can always vote, but you have no choice. And this is what we have seen over 20 or 15 years, at least in Europe, that we had pensée unique, so sort of one uh, economic thinking. Uh, we have seen that Chancellor Schröder, who is a social democrat in Germany, has done very conservative sort of policies. So it's no choice. And and the other camp of the people who feel like there should be some choice, they are heading into populist parties, and this is the 
breakup of uh, something like 30 to 60 percent in the party system, with 30 percent being on the uh, more radical uh, um, ends, uh, be, be that left or right, and the 60 percent still being in the uh, no choice camp. Yeah, um, and so I think it's not going to be a left right wing discussion as we were used to it in the say before 89 period, because it's precisely that the moderate left agrees with the moderate right, and they are on no choice. It's austerity. It's we need to obey to markets. That you have the 30 percent on the other hand who are basically yelling against this pensée unique. Huh? So, and now the question is, is there real economic choice? I mean, your argument is basically saying Hollande has no choice and he will be sanctioned by market and it's not wise to do 75 percent of taxes and so on and so forth, which is a little bit this compliance to markets argument and he will be punished and sanctioned and he cannot enter policy choice. I wouldn't agree. I mean, we may discuss or not whether 75 percent of uh, taxation is a good thing, but uh, get lending capacity to European Investment Bank, do infrastructure projects for Europe, uh, promote smart grids in energy, transportation and um, and uh, 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 transportation and uh, ICT technologies. I think this is good. And I think there is something to look for in how you get um uh, invest, investment financed again and how you have a balancing policy mm. between growth and austerity. Because what is happening precisely is that we all go into recession and then you can no longer afford social policies and that's what you earn at the wings. Yeah. Well, certainly, certainly there are some political ramifications, political fallouts of this financial debt crisis. It's been mentioned numerous times now on this panel. And let's have a look. The people are rising up. The people are protesting against the strict austerity measures implemented by their governments. Let's have a look how this plays out. Desperate attempts by the Athens government to get a handle on Greece's debt have hit the people hard, and they're not taking it quietly. Pensioners have seen falls in their income, while another 15,000 public sector workers are due to be laid off this year. With unemployment already around 22 percent, that means real pain. Portuguese civil servants have also seen brutal pay cuts. There is widespread anger at the new government headed by Prime Minister Pedro Passos Coelho. In Italy, Mario Monti's new administration has announced another raft of austerity measures, including a rise in the pension age to 66 and higher taxes for the wealthy. The mood in Spain is equally dark. With youth unemployment running at over 50 percent, the country now faces its toughest budget since the Franco era. How much more belt tightening can ordinary Europeans take? Well, Quentin Peel, certainly we've seen the voters backlash, the political, uh, the, the citizens backlash against the politicians here. And there seems to be no end in sight, is there? I mean, many governments have already fallen victim to this financial debt crisis. And we have an important election coming up in Greece and, and France on May 6th, two very important state elections in Germany. Is this the tune now has, has uh, fiscal Fiscal discipline gone out of fashion? Well, I think, one, it was inevitable there'd be a backlash. When you get a real nasty political down, uh, economic downturn, people blame the government first. So that was going to happen. But two, austerity alone is, doesn't seem to be the answer for people. They say, this is too much. We're using, certainly, when it's as extreme as in Greece, which is dramatic, Clearly, we've seen the reaction. But the question is, what about a country like France, which is much more, uh, it hasn't had the, the, the same uh, extent of economic downturn. Um, but nonetheless, people are pretty angry there. I think there's a real worry about the future of the welfare state. And I think that's under pressure. And it, this is a very long-term issue, because our demographics are against it. We are getting older. Uh, and there are fewer young people who are going to work to pay for this. So the welfare state is going to be shrunk. So we've had this combination of the long-term process, the welfare state being under pressure, and the short-term financial crisis, immediate austerity making it even tougher, so that people are getting actually more and more... I wouldn't say necessarily angry, but very insecure. And I think that's what we're seeing. So uh, Quentin Peel is saying austerity alone in and of itself is not enough. It needs growth as well. And if you look at Spain, 50% youth unemployment. Yeah. 
It's insane. But what is also insane, and it wasn't in your clip, is sort of what we are now facing is who's going to pay the price for the crisis. So let's resume that this crisis was mainly done by financial markets. And the question is also, uh, how do they pay who basically brought it into crisis? And this is the argument still out. I mean, Monty saved 35 billion or so through all the reforms he just did. But there are something like 100 billion out in Italy of people who don't pay taxes. So if you just could raise all these taxes from the wealthy Italians, you know, you would have to do less social reforms. And the same applies for Greeks, where all these ship owners are basically in London and they're paying no taxes. So there is, of course, an equation to make and who comes up for the price of the crisis. And I think that is one of the wealth distribution questions that we are now seeing in Europe. That is one thing. And the other, of course, is what Quentin mentioned. I mean, uh, we have just a global, global uh, labor market now. We have an influx of two billion uh, Indian and uh, Chinese people coming. Uh, Europe is getting older. We are just having 5% of world population. And we are defending a, a social contract, which is no longer valid on a global scheme, because other countries, which are more important in terms of populations, don't have the same social standards. So, and I think these are the two sort of uh, fault lines of the discussions we have to manage. And it's, it's really hard. Ohne van der Waal. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, I agree with uh, what you're saying on the welfare state, but um, I don't think the crisis was uh, actually a crisis created by the financial markets. It's still, in my view, a sovereign debt crisis, as it, as it is called. That means states gave, uh, spent it too much money, far too much money. And uh, that's why uh, the, the whole discussion about investments, as they call it, uh, is a little bit strange to me, because investments is just another word for giving money away to your clientele, right? Uh, what is investment? What does it mean? So um, in my view, that's, that's, that's not the right debate. The debate should be about really about cutting, so about austerity, and um, uh, because that is where the problem started. The government spent too much money, and they keep on doing that. But is, is that then the, the necessity to implement austerity measures, I think, are out of question. But uh, if, if well, the political out fallout of this is so severe, yeah. do you think politicians will still have the backbone, if you will, the, the, the will to, to go, go ahead with it? Well, that will be very hard, but I think the, the whole, I think many people could agree about, about many austerity measures. But I think people have the impression that like we are paying for the Greeks, right? And we have to, this is necessary because they spend our money. That's a, a kind of sentiment that's there. And that's why many of the austerity, austerity measures are not uh, uh, popular also to support. Ulrich Gero, of course, Una van der Waal mentions an important point, namely that there is a growing sentiment, certainly in a country like Germany, perhaps also in a country like the Netherlands, that the northern states, if you will, in the EU, are feeling, the taxpayers are feeling that they have to make up for the lack of fiscal discipline of the southern southern partners. And this is uh, one of the really, truly unbalanced thing within monetary union and the flaws, because what is happening is that Germany largely is benefiting from the single market and from the euro, especially German export industries and German industries at large. The problem is that the industries cash the advantages and German taxpayers pay for the fiscal deficits. And the unequation is a little bit there, that you can only control the fiscal side because states have only access to the fiscal ruling and therefore they do fiscal compacts and so on and so forth, but it doesn't not price in that Germany collectively in statistics earns a lot from the single market from the euro. It's just that the wealth distribution that Germany gets from the single market is unevenly distributed and then of course it's on the taxpayers' uh, shoulders to uh, give transfers to Greek and, and to Spain. But this imbalance, that is I think what we need to tackle, which is that we bring single market and euro align and that we look not only on fiscal policies, but that we look at policies how to complete the single market, how to share growth, how to think about value chains which give ownerships also to the periphery and these sort of things. And I think, by the way, that this thinking starts. Uh, and, and that is a very important point. And the second point is still that I would argue that if it comes down to who pays for the crisis, we need to think about things that precisely Hollande is also suggesting, like tax financial markets. There's no reason why financial transactions should not be taxed and why we should not have something like a Börsensteuer, stock market, market tax or stuff like that. So. Quentin Peel, uh, let's, uh, Germany has been mentioned numerous times and obviously it's playing a very prominent role in the attempt to, to bring back uh, austerity measures and fiscal discipline to Europe. Do you think that the, the uh, resignation of the Dutch government is a huge blow to Chancellor Merkel? Uh, do, do you think that she's increasingly isolated in her quest 
to bring fiscal discipline, budgetary discipline to Europe? I think, I think it's a real shock, actually, because there's no doubt that Mr. Rutter was one of her absolute key allies within the European Union. Um, and I think that, therefore, we've seen from Frau Merkel uh, that she is, in her usual pragmatic way, shifting ground. She started back last December, really, as a deal, I think, with her, her friend Nicolas Sarkozy in France, to talk about we've got to get growth as well as just having cuts. Now, she's adamant that that growth must not be financed by more debt. But on the other hand, she is talking about the structural reforms that need to be done. Um, Mario Monti in Italy is another man who's pushing this uh, agenda too, to say it's got to be a balance. And I think that's the way we're going. Now, are we going quick enough to satisfy an increasingly uh, unhappy electorate uh, and where all governments are feeling really under pressure, I think, that they, they don't know how to deal with the problem. One of the really baffling things about this crisis, if you like, is precisely that it's fact taking place within a European monetary union that doesn't quite work because you've got the wealthy North and, if you like, the, the, the South that's been much less competitive and therefore an imbalance between the two. And the worry from the North that we've heard from Una about people saying, uh, we don't want to pay for the South. The irony is they haven't paid for the South yet, but they're really scared they're going to have to in the future. Um, so far, they've done what Ulrika says. They've done very well out of it. Germany has done very well. And I do think we need to look at the German model and say, hey, this is the one country in Europe. Sweden is doing very well outside the, the Eurozone, but Germany is still doing fine within it. And you have this very curious situation where Germany is actually economically, from a labour point of view, unemployment is still coming down, doing fine out of the Eurozone. So Germany probably needs to do more to help the rest. While well, Germany needs to do more, says Quentin Peel, but Una van der Waal, of course, you do know the discussion about German leadership in Europe, namely, you're damned either way. Germany's damned either way, isn't it? If it shows too much, exerts too much leadership, it is uh, perhaps being criticized. If it uh, shows too little leadership, it is being criticized. So do you see, uh, do you see the dilemma that Germany is in? Well, yeah, but I think we are more or less beyond that point. I mean, because uh, Angela Merkel already took uh, much of the lead in Europe. Uh, and um, so uh, now we have come to a point that the countries are more or less on their own, I think. So uh, because the, all the, the, the fiscal treaty is in place, right? Actually, uh, not in every country maybe, but the, the agreements are there. So it's, um, and I think uh, looking at Germany is always or often used as an argument to do nothing, right? And to say to blame them instead of herself. I'm not I, sure the fiscal yeah. treaty is <laughs> yeah. really. No, in place. Yeah. And, it should and, be. It and, should and be. I'm not convinced that that's the solution out of the crisis if every country is more or less left on its own. But what I would like to do is a little bit of historical perspective that we need to talk periphery center relationship. And that is the relationship from Germany to most of the southern part. And historical evidence suggests that there is always sort of the power in the center. So we need to price in if we want to have a Euroland. And we want to see Euroland as one aggregated economy that the periphery ultimately cannot perform like the center. The blue banana is in Germany. We are largely benefiting and either we want to play, I overstate, the empire role like in the Roman Empire, then we pay for the periphery. That's what the Roman did. And then we want this because it makes us powerful and it gives us export markets and we basically uh, we have it all for us, right? But to say that you are basically comparing the countries, leaving them alone, you will never have Portugal being competitive with respect to Germany. It can not be. And I think this is the crucial choice we will need to face. I think this is also education towards the Germans saying you are the spider in the web, you have it all, the whole industrial value chain of Europe is sucked in by Germany. But this means that you, as Quentin said, that you Germans, we will need to think of fiscal transfers to the rest of Europe and not fiscal transfers there to lazy Greeks. Of course, the Greeks must reform their country and they must pay taxes. But in the sense of, that's one idea of Hollande, we go for a European unemployment assurance, for instance which would be an indirect fiscal transfer for Europe. 
So Germany seems to be the uh, consensus, consensus here must lead, must lead in, in, in order to overcome this, this crisis. But there seems to be some disagreement whether the fiscal pact is really already still in effect. Of course, 25 nations signed the fiscal pact a few weeks back. Uh, only Great Britain and the Czech Republic refrained from doing so. Um, but is the fiscal pact, does it have a future or is it not really unraveling? Let's have a look. Back in March, all European Union states but two signed up to a new treaty designed to stop states running up large deficits. A happy day for German Chancellor Angela Merkel. She's been one of the leading advocates of fiscal discipline. One of her chief allies is French President Nicolas Sarkozy. But since austerity has turned out to be a focus of controversy in the French election campaign, Sarkozy's enthusiasm for spending cuts has cooled. Socialist rival and front-runner François Hollande says he will put the emphasis on growth if he wins. Some on the left say choking public expenditure is helping to push voters into the arms of National Front leader Marie Le Pen. The politics of austerity have also been rejected by far-left contender Jean-Luc Mélenchon. In the Netherlands, another defender of fiscal discipline, Prime Minister Mark Rutte, has been forced to bow out, for the moment at least. This after he failed to garner support in Parliament for budget cuts. In the past, the Dutch have lectured southern European nations on the need to rein in public spending. The debt crisis has already caused the collapse of governments in other European countries, from Greece to Ireland. Is the fiscal treaty unraveling? Well, Quentin Peel, is the treaty unraveling if uh, Hollande wins on May 6th in France, as all polls seem to indicate that he will? Do you think it's the beginning of the end of the fiscal pact as it was initially intended by Germany? I don't think it is, but I think it is not going to be easy. Uh, I think that Hollande if he becomes president, and that's looking likely, will do a deal, actually, with Frau Merkel in Germany. And they'll do a deal where there's a growth pact that m mirrors, if you like, the fiscal pact. But actually, the immediate problem of getting there is not going to be very easy because we've got the French elections and, as you said, the Greek elections, both of which are somewhat unpredictable on May the 6th. On May the 31st, the Irish are due to vote in a referendum on that fiscal pact, and they may very well vote no. The Irish are an unpredictable bunch, and they voted no in referendums twice before. So we might suddenly have, whoops, it's all delayed, and everybody's going to reopen it. Mr Hollande is going to reopen it. And so the whole thing is back on the table. Now, the real problem of that is we'll have a pause for thought, if you like, yet again in Europe, and the markets won't like it at all. And they'll carry on, if you like, pushing up the cost of borrowing for countries like Spain that's in trouble and so on, and the Netherlands might lose its AAA rating. And that is going to be a real... So politics and the markets are actually in conflict. And Una van der Waal, what we're seeing is that the economic crisis, the financial crisis, is certainly turning into a political one, namely that more and more people are not only questioning the fiscal pact, but perhaps the concept of the, United, uh, the EU altogether, isn't it? We see the emergence of uh, uh, rightist parties uh, in the Netherlands, in France. Uh, and uh, also there's discussion now on the part of France and, and uh, Denmark and Germany if the Schengen Treaty might have to be, uh, you know, overlooked again, once again, right. of free movement, right. one of the very uh, stern pillars, if you will, of the EU. Um, is this going to lead to perhaps not only an unraveling of the fiscal pact, but perhaps the EU as an institution? Well, I think your scepticism, uh, uh, especially in countries like the Netherlands and also France, uh, uh, have been there for quite a while now. So, so we are talking about this for the past 10 years since since uh, France and the Netherlands both voted no against the European Constitution. Not many things have changed, I think the, uh, but I think the Euro crisis only uh, made those sentiments against all those Euro European institutions a little bit bigger. Um, and um, yeah, I think Europe will, will uh, continue to exist, um, but I think uh, the Eurocrats and the Euro, the fanatics who want to make Europe bigger and whatever, I think they, they have to back down a little bit. But how fundamental is this swing to the right? 
That's what worries me. And it, it, very interesting yeah. to hear from the Netherlands how seriously you would take Gert Wilders or Ulrike, because you were talking about the, the, the size of Marine Le Pen's vote mm -hmm. in France. Mm -hmm. One of the reassuring factors I find in Europe is that that swing to the right hasn't happened in Germany. Uh, but on the other hand, it is happening in Finland, in Sweden, in, in the Netherlands, in France. Uh, it's still a minority. That, it sort of reassures me. But if it became much more of a backlash, I think well, I really think in the Netherlands, for example, sorry, in the Netherlands is not a minority. I think uh, Geert Wilders' party is one of the big parties. Mm -hmm. It's around 20 percent. The Socialist Party, which uh, on the left side, the extreme left, is also very eurosceptical, Euro and they are quite as, bi uh, as big. You know, so this is what this is this fragmentation of the political spectrum. All the parties are. Uh, uh, around 20 percent, 25 percent, or whatever. So they are not small parties; they are big movements, and uh, the other parties have to uh, to react to that. And um, I think the same is happening in, in France on the left and on the right. Ulrike Gero, do you see a waning of enthusiasm for the EU? No, of course not. And I mean, let's first say that it's not it's, it, historically it's not new that the financial crisis became a political crisis. We have seen that in the past century, and it also took three years. Just to say this, yeah? and the, it, it also took a plurality of people, 30 percent, and, and not much more. I mean, just I mean, not to overstate the historical argument, but uh, there, I, I think there's really something we we should be concerned. And what we are, should be concerned of is precisely that lack of democracy, uh, which is the, which, which is the argument. Do we have policy choices? You know. And, and, and politics is about choices, and politics is about collective decision making, about societal preferences. So, and this is why this uh, austerity argument, there's no alternative, uh, is no longer accepted by large pluralities on the left and on the right. And I think this, we, we, we should um, uh, watch this. I think Europe is guilty in the sense that Europe, through the Maastricht Treaty, disentangled the, start, the state market relationship. And we left state on the national level, and we put markets and money and currency on the European level. So we disentangled uh, the regulatory powers of states on markets. And uh, this is precisely what we are paying a price for. So I, need, I think we need to fix it. Fixing it means probably that we need to think much more about uh, trans-European or transnational democracies, because it's not only a question for uh, the Netherlands, what happens in the Netherlands, as much as it's not only a question um, for France, whether Hollande wins. The win winning Hollande would have a true impact on, on Europe, on policy choices in Germany. So I think the next uh, sort of step of Europe to go over the populism is to really work on how can we make transnational democracy happen. So you want more Europe, more European but regulation better, more of the markets, yeah. more yeah. a more successful internal yes, market. And but that may play into, surely, exactly what Una's talking about, which is the Eurosceptic backlash. They don't want more Europe, they want less Europe. I agree. Uh, I think I, I'm not naive. I think this is the trend of the time, and uh, the the question is whether we are willing to struggle against it. Because I think the answer is more Europe, but a more democratic Europe, more transnational democracy, more regulatory issues, uh, state on market. But this means that you in basically empower the European state, and that could come through identity forging things like European social assurances, uh, European portability of social rights, uh, increasing mobility, and so on and so forth, which would need uh, make us think that Euroland is one aggregated economy and we talk about wealth regions and non-wealth regions rather than playing Greek against Germany or Netherlands against mm. France and so on and so forth. And I think this could be a process. I think we can work on this, but of course it's really heavy task. Yeah, but the, 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 I think the one problem that should be solved is that we don't give cheap money to, to the poor economies, uh, relatively poor economies again, because that is the basic mistake which is made in the Euro, right? They, the Greek and the Spaniards and the Italians and other countries, they paid, their interest rates were far too low and they spent so much money because of that. So that's a basic mistake. So the solidarity is, is, is basically fine, but I think this went too far and it got out of mm -hmm. hand. Mm -hmm. And what I think is uh, that we should also discuss less Europe because uh, may, take Asia. The economies are growing there. Do they have a union? No, they are competing. The countries are there, there in, those re in other regions in the world. They don't have unions. They are not integrating, they are, but they are highly successful and they are growing. Why is that? So is that the model that we've got to follow in Europe? Get rid of the well, unions, less Europe. It's a, it's a, it's, 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 an, it's an idea. I mean, uh, I don't always, think Europe's ready for it. I don't think I Europe think, wants that. But we have national economies. Uh, Germany has a highly national economy. 
I mean, uh, we all have national economies, and I think it should remain like that. We should play by the same rules. But, but I think we should also think about more competition. But Quentin Peel, of course, this discussion mirrors pretty much the discussion that is out there, more versus less Europe, isn't it? Yeah. And the, uh, if you want the election turnouts, the election results seem to indicate indeed that the people in Europe might perhaps want less Europe. Well, there's still a clear majority uh, uh, for more Europe in most of continental Europe, not in my own country, in Britain, where it's a very clear majority for less Europe. But on the other hand, it is a growing trend in the direction, Una is saying, of mm -hmm. people who are worried about it. What I would argue, and I would actually say that Ulrika's argument is entirely logical. That is to say, the answer to the problem at the moment is logically more Europe, because you can't make a monetary union work without more Europe. Mm -hmm. There may be a clash there between this trend for populations who say, more nation-state is the answer. Looking at the world economy, I would say that actually is crazy. Yeah. The idea that we can be competitive on a national basis. We need to have these transnational uh, champions. We need to have, actually, uh, big operators who can really compete with the Chinese on their level. Because each little state in Europe, including my own, Britain, cannot compete on its own. And we, and, and, and we need one currency to be a global competitor on the dollar, euro, yen, whatever, uh, remimbi side. And that is sort of, I think, that's the part of your argument where I don't go, which is that logically at the end of your uh, scenario, you don't keep a current currency. This is a discussion, of course, which is valid. I know that in Germany there are many thinking of mm. we should sort of uh, kick off the Greek and and, and, and not keep the, the, the current euro in the, in, the, in the current state. I think that is dangerous for political political reasons, for strategic reasons. I think we should also connect power and money and not only look at economic arguments alone. I think there are strategic components for Europe which forge us to, to, to stay together. Anything related to energy, energy supply, pipelines, power in the world, normative control and these sort of things. I think we are better off doing this together with Europe. But ultimately what I would say is if we go down your competitive sort of let the countries compete against each other, you don't keep a current currency. And my argument is, is the, current, the, the common currency currency is the tool that we need to be united in the world. So I think that's an argument we can we can discuss. Uh, yes, there are two sides. You have 30% of population across the European Union with you, and I know that's a real danger for my argument. So Ulrike Gero is certainly a very passionate proponent, <laughs> proponent of more Europe, but still the argument and the fact remains, doesn't it, that there seems to be a discrepancy between what needs to be done and what the voters are saying what the voters want. A plurality of voters. I, I mean, I do think there's a fantastically uh, flexible... Um, the, the, the whole political spectrum is in a state of flux. Mm -hmm. I don't think the voters do really know what they want. They're just dissatisfied with what they've had up to now. They're dissatisfied with the old political parties who they don't think are producing answers. And what we're seeing in Germany, for example, is this extraordinary growth from nothing of a political party, the Pirates, who had practically no policies. And yet people are rushing to vote for them precisely for that reason, that they think, oh, well, at least it's new, it's different. And that's the danger, of course, of this fragmentation of the political spectrum, because you're getting all sorts of quite narrow interest groups suddenly getting support. And then they have to try and form a government which has got to solve the most difficult financial and economic crisis that we have seen since the 1930s. So is that a healthy trend, though? It's a very worrying trend, I think, but it's a trend we've just got to deal with. So while I say, you know, Ulrika's right logically to say more Europe, can we deliver it with the, what the, the, mm -hmm. the voters are saying, which is, we're not sure we like this. So what is the way out of this dilemma, Ohne van der Waal. <laughs> Yeah, well, if anybody has the answer, be my guest. I mean. <laughs> Give it a shot. Nobel Prize Give it a shot. Question. Take a crack at it. What is the well, dilemma between the, the problem that, that... What is the way out of this dilemma? Well, that first of all, uh, we are all Democrats, so it's very important that, that, uh, that politics and also the European institutions uh, take uh, notice of what, uh, what the voters are saying. Uh, even if it hurts, and even if it's... Uh, and even if it's uh, supporting I mean, it, undemocratic parties? What is undemocratic? If it, they are voted for, I mean, we have no undemocratic parties in our country, and I don't think in any other country in the European Union. 
So uh, democracy is functioning and it has its risks, uh, but I think uh, it's, it should be relevant to uh, de decision makers, uh, what the voters are saying. I, I think there are two things. The first is just to say it's tragic. Tragic is if when both sides are right. Both sides are right. I mean, those who are the opponents, who are the losers of the system, they are right, and they have the right to vote, the protest vote for radical parties. And the others may be right in saying, uh, what are the policy choices out there? So I think that there, there, is, a, there, there is a notion of tragedy. Yeah? We know what we should do, but what we should do, we cannot do, and how we do, do we go out? And I think there's a fair assessment to say that's really not easy, what we are facing now. And what it is, is hollowing out politics. I mean, this is happening. And it's, it brings me back to my argument, we still can vote, but we don't have a choice, uh, which is the Colin Crouch argument, and that is that the, the, we have more democracy, everybody participates, the pirates do liquid democracy, everybody's on the internet, whatever doing, but uh, you are hollowed out because you feel like you're sovereign. The moment you are in power, you cannot implement your policies. I would bet today that even if Marine Le Pen should be the next president of France, which she won't be, but can she implement that France exits the Euros? Can she? I mean, what would be the market reaction? Can she implement to, to close the borders of Schengen? I mean, it would come close to a revolution. So, the, the, so she, she can make these pledges in her campaign. Can she implement policy? What's her sovereignty? These are the question of tomorrow. Let me just get a. Let me just do a quick final round. The U.S. economist and Nobel Prize winner Paul Krugman said this week, and he said it over and over again. But he said again in a very prominent column this week that the euro was a mistake from, from the get-go. We celebrated the tenth anniversary of the euro. Not too, not too long. Do you, do you think that, if you give me a quick assessment and a thought, do you think we're going to uh, experience and see the 20th anniversary of the euro? Yes, but I think it's going to be a pretty uncomfortable period. I think the euro was a project ahead of its time, and we're now living with the fact that actually this was a premature birth, and like with all premature births, there's a lot of effort to get that child into a healthy condition. That's where we are now. So you're saying the 20th anniversary of I, the Euro, we will... I believe we will celebrate that. I'm not sure that the United Kingdom will be part of it. I think it probably won't. But having said that, I think we'll get there. Uh, Ole van der Waal, very quickly, do you think we'll see the 20th anniversary of the Euro? Yeah, I'm sure we will, but maybe not all the countries will take part in it. I agree. Uh, we did it halfway, half-hearted and halfway. We now need to do the second step. It wasn't a mistake, but we just did half of it. Well, there's still a lot, a lot of work that still remains to be done. It's very clear from the discussion today, the euro crisis is far from being over. And uh, the political ramifications of this crisis are also still, uh, far from being over. I want to thank my three guests for their insight. And I want to thank you out there for watching and looking forward to seeing you again next week for a new edition of Quidriga. <laughs>